Good morning. Good morning. Very warm welcome as we join together for worship here in Alexander Presbyterian Church. Well, uh, last week uh, I gave you a week's notice that we were going to sign the fire alarm, and we're going to do that very shortly. I have to pass a nod here, and a nod has to go down the hall as well. So we're going to sign that uh, very shortly, and that's just so that we are familiar or aware, maybe, of what it sounds like. Uh, with COVID and all the rest of it, we don't want to practice maybe a, an exit and have to get everybody up and out of their seats and moved around. But just to let you hear it, um, if we do uh, in the unlikely event need to, to evacuate the building, we'll all make our way um, out to the front where possible. We'll try and still follow the one-way system and keep ourselves right that way, but we'll all make our way um, out to the front if uh, we ever need to hear it for real. So we're going to hear it now. Some of the, the children or younger people or maybe anybody who doesn't like louder noises might want to brace themselves. We're going to hear it very shortly. Well, just a couple of other announcements before we begin our uh, time of worship together. First one is to remind you that uh, Free Food Friday will be continuing this week and hopefully uh, each Friday throughout the summer. So the table will be there from half nine until the, the food is gone. Whatever we get the night before from Tesco will be on uh, the table. Holiday Bible Club will run this week from, or sorry, this summer from Monday the 16th of August for a week and we're going to have our next in-person meeting on Tuesday the 20th of July. So registration for that is now open online and we have a, a few spaces left so please do uh, pass on the word. Anyone who is in P1 to P7 is very welcome and along to that. And the community mission worker post, the applications for that are also now uh, open. Uh, you can get an application form, a full job specification and all the rest of it from myself. And the closing date for that is the 13th of August. So please continue to, to spread the word. We've had some um, expressions of interest in different things for that already in this first week, which is very good and, and very encouraging. Um, from next Sunday, I'm going to be off for a few Sundays uh, on uh, annual summer leave. So Ken Duggery will be providing pastoral cover during the week. So if anyone uh, does need that or require that, please speak to any uh, elder and they will um, gladly put you in touch uh, with Ken and we'll have uh, various different speakers, including Ken, for a couple of weeks here uh, on, uh, on a Sunday morning. Uh, and our final announcement is to say that uh, Phil Massey has stood down from uh, his position as elder on Kirk Session with us here uh, in Alexandra as he moves on. And Phil goes with our support, our friendship, uh, and our very best wishes. I want to take this opportunity just to thank Phil for uh, his work and his service on session, as well as the Sound and Vision team on a Sunday morning. Uh, with various other things like summer scheme and, and different bits and pieces during uh, his time with us. So he, he will be missed and we want to thank him for uh, his service and send him on with our, our best wishes and, and our thanks as well. Well we've come this morning to worship together uh, and our call to worship is from Psalm 107. Let me read the first three verses of that as we come to worship together. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Well, we are God's people gathered this morning, aren't we? Gathered as the redeemed gathered to worship and we want to tell our story. And we're able to do that as we sing our opening praise. Um, we've been worshipping together or back worshipping together for around a year or so now. We've stayed seated uh, as we have done that. But we, as restrictions uh, begin to ease and things begin to open up a little bit, we're, we're going to stand together uh, as we sing both our opening and our uh, closing hymn. It's quite a long time. I appreciate sometimes having to sit throughout the whole service. So we're going to stand uh, as we sing together again. And we're going to stand for our opening hymn, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So let's stand and praise God together again. Thank you.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can join our hearts and we can join our voices together in that ancient praise, Lord, as we cry Alleluia, as we sing Alleluia to the one who is worthy of all of our praise. Father, thank you that we can come together. Thank you that we can join our voices together. Thank you that we can even see one another as we come together as the church. Lord, over this last year or more, we know that there have been and those breaks and opportunities to do that. Lord, we know that our uh, our hearts have been discouraged as we've been on our own and as we've been divided into different places. And so, Father, we don't take for granted that we can come together and we can, Lord, join in that praise that your people have sung for centuries upon centuries as, as we cry, Alleluia, to the Lord of Lords. And Lord, we do come this morning bringing all the, the worship that is due to your name. Lord, we come having gathered in, in response to, to all that you are. Lord, being able to join with the psalmist and saying that truly you are good. Lord, we know that your goodness extends across the whole earth. We know that you are the creator of this world and everything in it. We know your goodness is seen and known because creation is continually pointing to its creator. We know your goodness is inescapable because of what you've made cries out to reveal, to point itself to the one who placed it there in the, the first place. Well, there's the, the psalmist goes on to say, where can we run from you in this world? Where can we flee from your presence? Or this whole world is yours and, and everything in it. And Father, as we think about your goodness this morning, we, we remember what the, the psalmist encourages us and, and tells us to do, to let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Lord, in our worship this morning, we thank you that we are able to do exactly that. We are able to worship because we are redeemed. Worshipping because, as we thought about last week, that your son has done something for us that we could never do for ourselves. We thank you that he has brought us the forgiveness of our sins. And all of those things that we think and we do and we say, all that separates us and keeps us from you. Father, we thank you that he has redeemed us. We thank you that he sets us free because of the cross. And so, Lord, we thank you that we can remember your goodness. We thank you that we can remember that we are the redeemed of the Lord. And we thank you that we can come because of your steadfast love. Your steadfast love that has been shown to us throughout the generations. Your steadfast love which is known to us because of the cross and because of the empty tomb. Lord, may we know and may we sense that steadfast love of the Lord as we join together for our worship this morning. Not only as we cry Alleluia with our voices, but Lord, as we hear from your word, as we have ears that would hear, as we, have, we would have minds that would understand. Lord, may we know even a little bit more of your steadfast love as we join together this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've come to uh, the final chapter of First Samuel and the last in our, our series in the book that we began right at the beginning of the year. So we're going to turn and read together from First Samuel chapter 31. If you have a Bible with you, if you have it on your tablet or phone or something else, please do turn to that and we're going to read together now and the words will be on us. Now the Philistines fought against Israel and the Israelites fled before them and many fell dead on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons and they killed his sons Jonathan, Abinadab and Malchishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armour bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or those uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But the armour bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armour bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armour bearer and all 
his men died together that same day. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of the Asherites and fastened his body to the wall at Beth Shan. And the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul. All their valiant men marched through the night to Beth Shan. He took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and went to Jabesh where they buried them. They took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and they fasted seven days. Amen. We thank God for his word. We thank him for the, the word that we've been able to read today and for the, the, the book and all that we find from it in the first well, uh, around once per month in Alexander, we uh, think about this time tomorrow with someone uh, who is a, a member here uh, with us in Alexander. We ask them and, and hear a little bit about their life and their faith. And we do that, I suppose, in order to, to encourage us, in order maybe at times to challenge us and to allow God to speak to us and, and see uh, what it means to really live out our faith in the everydayness of, of life. And today I'm going to ask if Harm Higgins will come forward and we're going to hear um, a little bit uh, more from Harm. We've, we've heard him preach a couple of times uh, since their return to Alexander, but maybe we'll find out a little bit more uh, this morning. We'll, we'll swap places. You, you take the mic. Uh, free to take off your mask. Well, Karen, tell us first of all, what, what does your this time tomorrow look like? What does a, a normal Monday morning look like uh, for you? Well, it starts at 5 o'clock in the morning, like Monday to Friday. Monday to Friday is 5 o'clock in the garden shed. Mm -hmm. And I spend time, that's my quiet time. I write my devotional. Some folk here actually read it. <laughs> and, and the idea of doing it is the thoughts to try and encourage folk uh, who have a problem getting through their day. You know, there are so many people who just need that encouragement. Like on Friday there, I was asked by a South African reader uh, that uh, her friends had now left and gone, returned to England after her husband's business had gone into liquidation. And she followed him here, but when she got here, he had been unfaithful and he, he had another lady friend and she phoned him. She had written to me to tell me that this was the situation and that her friend was almost suicidal. Mm. So I have been in touch with her, she's 70. And when you get to 70, you're sort of unemployable. So she's 70, she's in England, she doesn't know what way, she's tur what way to turn. Mm. And we've, we've written to one another and I've prayed with her. Mm. That's five o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning is my God time. Yeah. Yeah, and lots of people, as you say, through, uh, through your Facebook page will have seen that and are encouraged by that on, on a daily basis, so it's really, really good to hear. Um, you're no stranger to the congregation. Um, tell us maybe when you, you first came here, it was before last year, whenever you, you rejoined, but tell us maybe when you, you first came here and some of those early connections with the congregation in Alexandria. Well, next week, next week we are associated with the congregation for 70 years. <laughs> uh, we were baptised by Robert Gibson here. Sandra and I on the same day. It's rumoured that I shouted over the <laughs> over the veil, I'll see you in 17 years. <laughs> so we've been together from we've both been associated with this congregation from from then. We've been in the BBE, we've served under three BB captains. Last one being I think Wesley. Davy Barr. When we look around and we see Isabel and uh, Elizabeth. There were weaker hearts when we were when we were here. So we've had this is our home. This is our spiritual home. And we I don't I think we'll be we'd be buried from here. 
Well, I'll not, I'll not go back the past too much longer in case you start giving away date of births with different, uh, different people. But where did life take you after that? Obviously, growing up through here and spending time here, but where did life take you after, after that period of time? Well, we, like I say, we spent our youth here and we, we spent at 18, 19, maybe 20. We weren't so interested in Alexandra. Although we were still associated, although we still, I think somebody put an envelope in for us at that time. And we were associated, but we never had any real interest in, in Jesus. And we went off to Africa, 1981. I think we went to Africa, I think it was 81. And so we went to the gold mines in Africa. And we were there for four years. And then I became a consultant to the Johannesburg Management Committee. Mm -hmm. And we worked there for, I think, eight to ten years. And then after that, we, uh, well, I got saved. I got saved in 1988. I got saved by running an ultra marathon from Peter Maritzburg to Durban. And Sandra had been saved the year before. And that year that Sandra was saved and I wasn't saved, it wasn't a great year. It was very difficult. And she dragged me off to church every Sunday. But then we, I got saved. And I got saved during that run from Peter Maritzburg to Durban. And we, it was never the same after that. I got involved in inner city mission in Johannesburg, in the red light area, you know, at Philbrough. And we saw it was a wonderful experience with Peter Jackson and there was we we took so many prostitutes out of prostitution and got them jobs in different homes. We set up a tent in the end of Abel Road and we got a, a black minister to go there. And then we would meet the girls on Friday night and we would tell them there's a feed on there for them tomorrow if they want to go. And the hope that this pastor would speak to them. And then he would refer them back to us and we would have jobs for them. And they would leave prostitution and go into normally working in other people's homes. And we also had great success with them and getting them back home. Because once they get into prostitution in, in Johannesburg, it was hard to get rid of their pimps. Their pimps had a real hold on them. And when we were able to get them home, see, they couldn't afford to go home. So when we were able to get them home, that was, that was a wonderful achievement for them, you know, they, and they've been drawn for some years. And Peter Jackson kept encouraging me to go into the ministry, but I had no call for the ministry. I didn't feel a call to the ministry. I didn't, I couldn't afford the ministry. Ministers over there don't get paid, they get buttons. And we had a good job in the council, plenty of money, and the thought of ministry, and I kept putting it off, I kept saying no. And then he got me to go to the selection committee and I was astounded because when we went to the selection committee they, they selected me. <coughs> and then I was in, you know, I couldn't get out really and I kept saying to them, you know, I'll find, my time will come, I'm not so sure. And I did that for a year until they said to me, look, if you don't go to this place and do the interview, then we're taking you off the list. So Sam and I discussed it and we decided to go to Zululand to Shawi. Hoping, I think, that maybe it wouldn't be the place for us, maybe they wouldn't want us. But when we got there and I preached, I just felt in the pulpit that day that, yeah, this is, this is the place for me. So I was there for 10 years mm -hmm. and it was a it was a wonderful experience. This congregation, Alexander, helped us out lots because we, most people know Jean, Jean Montgomery, John and David. They, when, when John sent me a thousand pounds, I think he sent it to help me out. <laughs> but he sent us a thousand pounds and we started what they call the John Montgomery AIDS Foundation with it because it was right in the, 
right at the time of the AIDS pandemic in Zululand and the kids were awash, the streets were awash with kids with no parents. Their parents had died because of AIDS and we set up a home for the John Montgomery AIDS Foundation and it was in the Moscow Township. And it's still going, you know, it's still there. We, have, we don't, we are not associated with it. When we come back, we, we sort of cut our ties because there was nothing we could, nothing more we could do. Mm. We still, well, that's a lie too, because we still keep in touch, but we don't, we don't fundraise anymore for it. Mm. And it was a, that was a wonderful experience. We've had, we've had kids come out of there. We've had one, we have one who's finished their degree in Cape Town and a couple of them who went through the high schools and a lot of them really benefited from, from your funding and it was a wonderful, that was a, a wonderful experience. Mm. We, also had a mission, we also had a ministry in Alamoya, which is the hills outside of Vishal and we built a clinic there and to this day the clinic is still, is still working. So the Lord took us to Ishawi and, and even against our will, mm -hmm. used us. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful experience. And this, at this time I also gave, take an opportunity to say thank you to you for who helped us during that time. It was, a, it was great. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there, there are lots more things that you could tell us about the experiences there, but maybe tell us a little bit about coming home after it was 10 years or so and, and what that looked like for you once you came back to, uh, to Northern Ireland? Well, we were, we, we were away 25 years. And as I said to you before we went, it was sort of a misspent youth. And I spent a lot of time on the Shankill Road. And I can assure you it wasn't for going to missions. And when on our way back, we sounded like pray. We said that, Lord, we'll serve you anywhere. But please don't send us to the Shankill Road. We don't really want to minister on the Shankill. So they sent us to Hillsborough. And we were a couple of months in Hillsborough. Hill, Hillsborough, I didn't suit Hillsborough. Hillsborough needed a different type of minister. I wasn't for Hillsborough. And we, went, we were sent, Donald Watt sent us back to the college because I had said to him, if you can't find another place for me, we would go back to Africa. And that wasn't, Sandra wasn't happy about that. But I was sitting in the college waiting to see what the outcome would be when Noel knew he walked in and he said, you're for the shankle with me. And I said, oh Lord, <laughs> that wasn't what we wanted. But it turned out to be, the, honestly, the two, the two most wonderful years of our ministry, no matter where we been or no matter what we'd done, those two years in, in Shankill Road in West Kirk were the two years of my ministry. They were the, the years that I really enjoyed in. And when Noel retired and they didn't call me, I was annoyed. <laughs> I was upset. But we went from there, we went to Claudie, to the Cumbers. And we were in the Cumbers for four years. And that was another great experience. We built a church there. Wow. The, the church in the village was, was falling down. And the folk, that was where the main congregation was. Another big church on the hill, but, but the congregation in Claudie was in the, the small church down there. And it was one of those that had heritage ties, so we couldn't do anything to it. And Sandra said to me one day, you'll have to do something. So I phoned the guy of the heritage and he was in London Derry that day and he came to see us. And I remember the conversation well because they, we had no chance of changing this building. This building was their building. And I asked him where the fire exit was. I said, there's only one door into this place and no out. Well, he says, you could put it in the corner. And then I asked him where the minister's room was because there was no minister's room. And he said that, I said, we didn't want the door open into the fields. We opened the door for air, the cows would come in. <laughs> and he says, well, we'll have a minister's room. We need one. 
And he gave us permission to do a ministry. And once he gave us permission to do a ministry room, then we built a big, big ministry room. <laughs> and we rebuilt the church inside the church. You know, we turned it around and we used to be an entrance as the fire exit. And those are the sort of things that the Lord has, has used me for. He's never, I don't think, well, I don't think anybody could ever say I would be a praise preacher. But he has taken us and he has used us in ways that other than preaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it has been a that has been a wonderful experience. Then we went to Killy Day. Oh. Killy Day was an experience. We've never had one church. When we were in Africa, we had a white church and a black church. Here we've had two churches, and then we went to another two churches. And each time the churches couldn't agree. It's been, I've been the pig in the middle. So now the last thing, that was the last thing the Lord used us for, was to bring Killy Days together. Now they're one church. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he has, yeah, those have been our years. And they've been wonderful years. Mm -hmm. And we feel, we feel blessed. We just, just, it just can't go on, you know. They stop you, they tell you that this is the end. And that's the hardest thing to take. People say to you, are you enjoying retirement? Well, no, I hate it. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me. Well, that, that leads on to the final question. I suppose ministers don't ever quite retire. And I think this is one of the few Sundays you're not preaching somewhere else, which kind of reflects that over the summer. But tell us maybe one or two things we can pray for, for you as, as a retired minister, quote unquote. Well, I think, I think in every minister, if you're going to, if you pray for, pray for me, if you're praying for me as a retired minister, you must just pray that the, the Lord would enable me to work to my last breath in Jesus' name. Because that's what we were called to. And that's what we need to do. And I don't think a Christian will ever retire. I think it's just, we just get an extension. And then at the end, we pray for glory. So, work or take me. That's what I would like you to pray for me. Okay. We will. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Feel free to, to take a seat. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Let me give Harry some encouragement as he takes a seat again. Give him a round of applause. Well, I'm sure many people know at least some of that story, but it was encouraging just for us all to, to hear that God's glory, wasn't it? How uh, he has used them both and how he has uh, used the family, not only uh, at home, but uh, much further in my faith as well. And we'll, we'll be praying for you later on during our, our prayers and our session. Um, but for now, those uh, children or, or uh, infants who are heading out to, to crash or KFC, you can head out uh, now. <laughs> Father, we pray that you would help them to know the power 
and the promises that are found in your word as they continue to mourn the loss of a father, a grandfather, and a great-grandfather. Father, we pray that you would help them uh, to know your word and help them to hold on to it. Help them to know that you are the one who promises to be their shepherd and you are the one who promises to remain. Lord, help them to know that they do not need to fear because you are with them. Because you are the one who provides your rod and your staff to tenderly and and firmly guide them. Lord, help them to know that, uh, Lord, you do this not only as they uh, walk through the easy and the straightforward times of life, but Lord, also as they make their way through the valleys. Help them to know you as the shepherd who is faithful and is faithfully uh, present Father, we also want to pray for our community at this uh, holiday time of year and as we uh, approach uh, bonfires and parades and and everything else that uh, will be associated with these uh, next few days. Father, we pray for our local area especially, which has been in the the headlines and uh, and has seen so much attention over these past days and weeks. Father, we pray uh, for calm heads and we pray for those who are in leadership. We pray that you would help them to make wise decisions. We pray that you would help uh, those who are in leaderships, leadership positions to, Lord, seek peace, uh, the goodness for this whole area, Lord, whoever and wherever they represent. Lord, we pray for uh, parades and, and different get-togethers tomorrow. Lord, we pray that that would uh, be a place and a time of, of safety. Lord, we pray for those who will take part and those who uh, will watch uh, alongside. Lord, we pray for uh, various um, orange orders in different places. We pray that the name of Jesus would be uh, raised high. Uh, Lord, whenever uh, not only they are getting together, not only whenever they are preparing and parading and marching, but Lord, also there is opportunities for your words to be shared and um, are taken. Father, we pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted far high and above any other name or any other cause at this time. Lord, we also want to remember Haram in our prayers. Lord, we thank you for uh, the many decades that we have heard a glimpse about for the full-time service from him and and Sandra. Lord, we thank you for the plans, not only uh, that you worked out in their lives, not only that you worked uh, through them for, but Lord, also the plans that you have for them in the days that are ahead. Lord, we pray that you help them as they um, continue to readjust, Lord, to a change in, uh, in patterns and a change in, in being retired. Lord, as Haram has said, we thank you that you call us, uh, and Lord, that call remains upon us until the day that you would call us home. And so we pray that you would help him and, and both of them to, to be able to, Lord, find out what that service looks like for them in these days and uh, these weeks and months and years that, that are ahead of them. Father, we thank you that uh, he has been able to share for your glory and been able to share, uh, Lord, what you have done through them. And we pray that that might give them confidence and assurance that you will continue to be at work through them in the various uh, ways that you have for them, not only here in the congregation, but, but in other places uh, as well. And Lord, we pray for all of those who maybe struggle to readjust uh, to retirement and the changes of patterns and routines and maybe things that are no longer there. Father, we pray you would help us to to be able to settle into that uh, different period of our life and, and to be able to enjoy a sense of rest and uh, fulfillment and know, knowing that, Lord, you continue to have a plan and, and a purpose for us. And so, Father, we want to bring all of these things before you. Um, we pray that trusting in your goodness for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we do move on to think about uh, the final chapter, the final installment in uh, our series in the book of 1 Samuel. And I suppose we could characterise that the last number of chapters as the last and the long goodbye. The reign of Saul has been and is coming to a long, slow and at times a painful end. The second half of the entire book could be described as the long goodbye for Saul as king. Chapter 14, just in the middle of the book, ends as it summarises Saul's family line and the events of his reign as king. It was a bit like a a synopsis of what it was like to have Saul as king of Israel. 
And ever since then, it has been the story of a long, slow, and at times painful uh, goodbye to Saul as Israel's first king. And the book, as we've thought about more than once, has told us the story of Israel's call for a king, their call for the first king that they had. God's people were looking for a leader, and more specifically, they wanted a king, a king to lead them, and that is what they'd set their hearts on. A king so that they could be like the other nations, to be led by a king, a warrior, someone who would go before them into battle. And things started out quite well on that front, didn't they? Samuel, whose uh, name uh, is, or who gives his name rather to the book, he's reluctant because he knows what giving the people their wish will mean. It will not be this idealistic picture that many of them have in mind as they think about a king. But Samuel seeks God and the people are given what they ask for. And initially it does begin well, right, right back in chapter 11, Saul is chosen as king. And as he is chosen as king, we see some of his first duty, some of his first responsibilities as Israel's first king. The Ammonites are threatening God's people and to the extent that God's people are willing to make a deal with their king. The Ammonites besiege them, they surround them at Jabesh Gilead and the king mocks them. The Ammonite king says he'll make a deal with them if he can gouge out every one of their right eyes. And it's a gruesome way of reminding them of who would be in charge if this king ruled over them. But Saul steps forward, doesn't he? Saul heard their words and the Spirit of God powerfully came upon him. And God intervenes through Saul. Saul musters the men together, he organises them and he comes up with a plan. And the plan is that their search for a saviour had failed. Or so the Ammonites think. And so the Israelites go, they cross the Jordan at night and they spring this attack on the Ammonites. A brutal and a violent attack, but that's what it took to deal with an enemy like this. And so victory had been secured and it had been led by Saul and all started so well. All started so well as Saul knew God's spirit was upon him. But soon that changed, didn't it, throughout the story of the book. Just a couple of chapters later, Saul's success had turned to failure. And it wasn't a military failure. He didn't lose any battles, but it was a failure of faith. He didn't do what God had told him to do. And his greatest failure wasn't anything to do with the men that he had gathered around him. His greatest failure wasn't anything to do with uh, the military power that he had surrounded himself with. His failure was that he didn't obey God's word. And that's what Samuel told him, wasn't it? You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. He failed to obey God. And so after this, it began very quickly a downward spiral in failing to obey God on more than one occasion. And before he knew it, he was trying to take the life of his own son, Jonathan, and of David, the one that God had already chosen to be the next king. And so this long goodbye has been working its way out for Saul ever since. And it finally comes to a head in this last chapter of the book, chapter 31. And as chapter 31 begins, it repeats what we saw last week with the final installment of David's story because it rewinds us back a little bit in the story. <coughs> We're taken back to chapter 29 when the Philistines were ready to attack the Israelites. And Achish, one of the five Philistine commanders, brings David along with him on the battle, didn't he? David, who had given himself to the Philistines. But the, the rest of the Philistine commanders see him, they see David, and they see his men. They say, no way, we're not bringing this Hebrew with us to attack more Hebrews. He can't be trusted. And so we return now to chapter 31 when the Philistines are on the march, minus David and his men. And you know, there have been different enemies of God's people, haven't there, that have been detailed throughout this book of 1 Samuel. There have been the Ammonites, there have been the Amalekites, but the threat of the Philistines, that's never been very far away, has it? The Philistines have always loomed large 
in the background. And even in the occasions when God's people enjoyed success, whether it was briefly under the likes of Jonathan or maybe more memorably, whenever David defeated Goliath and they scattered, the threat of the Philistines has always been there in the book. They have always been the most prominent enemy of God's people. And so chapter 31 opens with the detail that the Israelites fled before them and many of them fell dead on Mount Gilboa. <coughs> God's people are fleeing as the book comes to an end. And there's a certain amount of irony in that because it takes us back almost to the beginning of the story, to another time whenever the Israelites flee, whenever God's people fled. Back in chapter 4, they suffered a disastrous loss. Do you remember they suffered a loss of 4,000 men in a particular battle with the Philistines? A really significant number, and one that left the leaders, the elders, to do a lot of soul searching. And the irony is, that soul searching led them to do something in particular. It led them to call for a king. And now, how does the book end? The book ends with another disastrous defeat. And the Israelites are fleeing once more. And as the people push for their plans to be fulfilled and their wish to be granted, they're not one bit better off, are they, at the end of the book? They continue to flee the Philistines. They asked for a king. They called for a king. They were told what that would mean and what that would look like. And they said, no, we want a king. This is the answer to our problems. This is what we need. We need a king. And yet here they are continuing to flee the Philistines. And you know, maybe there's a little bit of a, a lesson for that, uh, in that for us, isn't there? As we think about how the book begins and ends with the Israelites fleeing the Philistines, with how God gave them what they asked for when they insisted this was the right thing. Maybe there's a lesson for that in our own prayers for how we ask for things from the Lord. Sometimes our prayers can resemble that of the Israelites, can't they? Sometimes we can be sure in what we ask for. Sometimes we can be in no doubt what is the right thing we tell God. Sometimes we can be certain this is the best thing for us and we continue to ask God for it. But the book of 1 Samuel and the whole story of it reminds us that, that we're not always right, are we? We don't always get it right, even in the things that we pray for, in the things that we ask for. And sometimes our prayers can be answered totally differently to how we think they should, to how we are certain they need to be answered. How does that leave you? How do you feel whenever your prayers are answered very differently to how you think they should be? Are you left deflated? Are you left frustrated? Maybe even you're left angry with God? But there's a lesson that's been running throughout the story of, of 1 Samuel. There's a lesson that's been there running throughout this whole call for a king right from the beginning and right now to the very end. And it's that there's things that we can be sure and certain of when we ask for them, but they might not always be the best thing. Things that we are completely sure that God should answer for us, but they're not always what he has in store for us. And you see, that's because God's ways aren't always our ways, are they? And he reminds us of that. He reminds his people and he reminds us of that through the prophet, through Isaiah. Isn't that what he says in chapter 55? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. The high end, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And so my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And God's people have surely been realising this throughout the story, throughout the timeline of First Samuel. They flee, they, they search their souls and they ask the Lord for a king. They demand a king. And yet here we are at the end of the story. What are they doing? They've been given a king. 
We've been given what they asked for and they continue to flee. And so in chapter 31, the Israelites flee as, uh, as they have this king that they called for. But it's not enough, is it, to stop the Philistines catching up with them? We're told firstly that three of Saul's uh, sons are killed in battle. Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishu. Jonathan, the, the son that, that's most familiar to us in this story of First Samuel. And it's a tragedy really for us to read this type of end for him. Because he struck the most unlikely friendship with David, didn't he? The most unlikely friendship because Jonathan is the one who should have inherited his father's throne. And yet he does all he could to help David. He does all he could to support David right throughout the book of First Samuel. And he did that because he knew David was the Lord's choice. And so he takes on some of the leadership that his father should have whenever he takes a battle to the Philistines earlier in the book. He helps David. He testifies to David's innocence. He risks his own life to help David. And he helps him to hide whenever he was on the run from his father. You know, in many ways, Jonathan's death, this final hurdle, really is a surprise. And it's tragic. Because if we've been following the story, we think it shouldn't end like this for Jonathan. This is not the way it should finish for him. He has consistently been one of the good guys in this story. But as lots of loose ends are tied up in this chapter, we remind ourselves that Jonathan died having shown faith in how he lived. And there's not much of a greater legacy than we could leave behind in this, is there? That we can leave behind a legacy of having lived out faith, of having trusted God and that being reflected in how we live our life. See, he could have sided with his father, couldn't he? He could have demanded what he felt was his rightful place as heir to the throne. But as the Lord would have brought about things in this way, he never would have seen what he demanded, would he? He never would have been the heir to the throne. He never would have taken the crown for himself. But he died knowing that the Lord was working out his purposes. He died knowing that David was the Lord's anointed. He died having shown faith in how he lived. And as the chapter progresses, it's not only Saul's sons who die, is it? The fighting grew fierce around Saul, verse 3 tells us. And when the archers overtook him, they wounded him. See, at this point, Saul knows he can't carry on, and he turns to the only companion he has left in life, and it's his armor bearer. And he tells his armor bearer, finish me off. Take your sword and finish me off. Don't allow the Philistines to find me. And as one commentator points out, there's another little thread that has been tied up in this chapter, because who used to be his armor bearer? It used to be David. David should have been the one who was at his side but now it's this other unnamed man and he's terrified he doesn't want to do what the king asks him to do so Saul falls on his own sword it's a real scene of death and finality isn't it just one verse given to the death of Israel's king so Saul and his three sons and his armor bearers and all his men died together that same day And yet there's something poignant, something symbolic in how Saul dies, isn't there? It's not not at the hands of the Philistines or even at the hands of other enemies that we've seen like the Amalekites or the Ammonites who have always lurked around the edges of the stage of this story. It's none of the great enemies of Israel who have taken Saul's life, is it? Nor was it David. Remember those two perfect opportunities that he had? Once when Saul came into the cave that he was hiding in and once when he was so close to where Saul was sleeping that he could have taken his sword. It's not at the hands of David. It's not at the hand of his enemies. And said, instead, Saul takes his own life. And it's symbolic in this way because the reason Saul found himself in this weary stricken position is because of who? It's because of Saul. 
The second half of the story has told us that, hasn't it? As we have seen this long goodbye, we have seen the story of this unrepentant king. Building up to the story of a broken man, someone who just a few chapters back has to be convinced to eat. Such is his what weariness and such is his plight. But there have never been any signs of repentance from Saul, have there? Not when he failed to do what God told him to. Not whenever he had the opportunity to listen to God's command again with the Amalekites to destroy everything and he didn't. Not whenever David twice spared his life. There were tears, there was regret, there were promises to David. But there's no repentance. Because quickly he turned back and went to his old ways, didn't he? There have never been any signs of repentance from Saul in this book. No turning from his sin, but instead turning back to it every time. And you, we've seen in the story of 1 Samuel opportunities that God has given time and time again. But not one of them has been taken by Saul. No repentance from this king. And it's a tragic end to Saul's story as we find it here. And it's symbolic of all that's led up to it. No one took Saul's life. Not his enemies, not David, but Saul himself. And you know, as I've said before in this series, the book of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel just form one book. In Hebrew, they form the book of Samuel. We're going to leave our six, seven month series here, but maybe you're encouraged enough to keep reading. Maybe you want to go home and you want to read 2 Samuel and, and see what happens next. Well, if you do, you'll find David as the one who ascends to the throne. Finally, his long road to the crown will be over uh, as you turn the page in 2 Samuel. But we leave our series here and we find a lot of loose ends that have been tied up in this final chapter. Because the end of Saul's story, not only does it reflect all that has come before it, but it takes us right back to the very beginning. Well, almost the very beginning. Back to chapter 2. Remember what we find in chapter 2? We find a song. A song from Hannah. And it seems like a long time ago that we thought about this song. But Hannah praises God as he answers her with the birth of a son. With Samuel. Who played such an important part in the story. And what's at the very centre of this song of thanksgiving as we thought about a long time ago, central to it is the fact that God is the God of reversals. God is the God who turns things upside down. God is the God who reverses things that we never thought could be reversed. And Hannah points out the, facts that, the fact that God often does the opposite of what we would think or expect or imagine. She herself goes from being so downhearted in the first chapter to exalting the Lord as he answers this unlikely prayer of giving her a son, of giving her Samuel. But it's not just how God works in the story of Hannah's life that we see this to be true. It's not just how God does things now and again with some characters or some people in the life of First Samuel or even his word that we see this to be true. But we know that it is true overall. We know that it is true for us and in our world as well. What does Hannah sing? What does she praise God with? She says, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and he lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and he has them inherit a throne of honour. You know, we live in a world where people know their place, don't they? We live in a world where we know our place. Working class, middle class, upper class, whatever it may be. Whatever category we tend to fall into, we know our place. And we know the place for others as well, don't we? But that's not how the Lord works. That's not the standards that he lives by. That's not the way that he works in our lives. He is often the Lord of reversals. He is often the Lord who does things differently to how we would expect or how we would imagine. And that is what we've seen worked out through this story of 1 Samuel, isn't it? 
how it's been worked out in the stories of two of the main characters in the book of Saul and of David. And the stories have been intertwined, at times flicking between one and the other, and at other times bringing them both together. But we've seen how God has been a God of reversals. We saw it with Saul when we were first introduced to him. Who was he? We're told that he was a foot taller than anyone else. And how does the book end? The book ends when he is not a foot taller than anyone else, when he has fallen. How does he start? He starts up here. Where does he end? He ends down here. And then there's David. We remember memorably, don't we, where we find David. We find him as the youngest son of Jesse. We find him as the smallest and most insignificant son of Jesse. And yet, where will the story end for him? Well, it begins down here and it ends as he is the king of Israel. It ends as he is the man after God's own heart. And all of this is brought together with this tragic end of Saul. Because not only does this mean the death of Saul, but it means David is ready to ascend to the throne. What does that help us to see as we find these loose ends that are tied up at the end of 1 Samuel? Well, it emphasizes to us again that the Lord really was working out his plans. It tells us again that he really was bringing about these reversals that the world would never have imagined. And it tells us that he continues to do that. It tells us that he continues to do that in our world and in our lives. All of those times that we made our way through the story and we might have wondered if Saul would ever leave the throne. Well, he has. Those times that we made our way through the story and we wondered if David, like David himself, would ever find that promise of the crown coming to bear? Well, it has. The God of reversal still doing things that we would never expect. Still changing things and turning things around. That's how he continues to be in our lives. We don't want to be like Saul. We don't want to be like that unrepentant king, do we? Given chance after chance after chance to take this invitation from God to turn away from our sin and to turn to him. And we see David instead, don't we? David by worldly standards. David by those who were looking on would have thought he'll never be king. A promise will never come about. Look at all those things that are taking him further and further from the throne. And yet at times that's how God works in our lives, isn't it? Times when we can't see it. Times when we don't understand it. And yet he continues day by day and hour by hour working out his plan for us. Changing things that need to be changed. Bringing things about that need to be changed. And whenever we trust him we can know that that is what he is doing. And whenever we know that he is this God of reversals it means that there is nothing that, that he cannot turn around for his glory. Nothing that he cannot achieve for his plans and for his purposes. He is the God of reversals. Let's pray as we finish. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that as you remind us right in the middle of this book of First Samuel, you are not the one who looks on the outward appearance. You are not the one who is restricted to knowing what is happening or, or what is going on on the outward. But we thank you that you're the one who can look into each of our hearts. And Father, we pray that as you would do that this morning, that Father, we would see the example of Saul. We would see the example of this one who is the unrepentant king. The one who continued to turn away from you. The one who continued to reject those opportunities that he had. Father, help us not to be like that in our hearts. Or help us to hold on to your promises. Help us to hold on to what we know to be true about you. And just like David, to know that you are working about all that you planned and all that you have for us. Father, this we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand again as we sing our concluding hymn or our praise together.
Go forth and tell the church of God away. Let's stand as we sing. Thank mm-hmm. you.